Good evening and welcome to Fitness Technology Friday. Super excited for this video. This is the one I've been the most excited to create because I love basketball and I love sneakers. I told you all a couple of weeks ago when I was creating my, uh, my running shoe video, my outside shoes for working out, that I was a sneakerhead. And today I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of my collection, share a little of my office with you. And we're gonna talk about some of the cool technology that came around in the basketball shoes. What we're gonna do today is we're gonna walk you through the history of basketball shoes, share some of the uh, really cool technologies and innovations that came along uh, along the way. I'll share some of my collection with you and we'll talk about what to look for in a basketball shoot today. But to start the video, we gotta start where the whole thing began and that's gonna be the Chuck Taylors, the All-Stars, right? This shoe came out uh, in the 1920s. Uh, it actually all started when a, uh, a young semi-professional basketball player named Chuck Taylor started to work for Converse and asked him to help build a better shoe. And what Converse did is they made this amazing canvas shoe with this hard rubber sole that had a lot more support, right? It had better, better insulation, so better shock absorption when you would play. They created an insole that actually had a little bit of movement in there so you could actually get a little better stability. It was designed to reduce blisters. So for the first people playing, this was the first shoe. And all the way through the 1950s and 60s, this shoe dominated who would play professional sports in it. What I'm always shocked by is guys like Bill Russell and Will Chamberlain played their whole careers in a shoe like this with almost no ahenko support, not a ton of cushioning, but this was so revolutionary at the time. And you'll see as we go through, we'll talk about the technology in the shoes. A couple things you want to keep in mind when you're thinking about a basketball shoe. One is how much cushioning is it going to give us? One is what kind of toe box support are we going to get? So that's going to be this piece right here. And the toe box is going to, you know, a couple of things. One is it's going to help with the forefoot stability, but it's also going to help so we don't, you know, our feet don't get crushed if we get stepped on or we're playing, right? Help us prevent those stubbed toes. The other thing we want to look at is we want to look at the heel basket here. And what that's going to do is it's going to basically give us support in the heel uh, for our Achilles. And then you're going to look at the materials that it's made of. Like I said, the Converse Chuck Taylors just dominated through the 1950s. And I am shocked that those guys played. You think about someone like a Will Chamberlain, right? Seven foot one, 280, 300 pounds, playing 48 minutes a game. Will average 48 minutes a game wearing this shoe. But now when we advance a little bit, we get into the 70s. And in the 70s, uh, 1969, Adidas came out with the shell toe. A little different technology. Again, you'll see here. And you'll see the textures on the bottom of the shoe. You hear me talk about this as we advance through the different technologies, the different decades. But what was pretty cool on this technology uh, was again, these are designed to give better grip, better traction when you're playing. When you think about that, that tire that you have, that high performance tire, there's a couple things you wanna have on there. One is gonna be to do, uh, to basically give us grip. The other one is gonna help, uh, you know, get around dust or dirt on the floor. Uh, you know, any type of moisture on the floor. And again, not everybody's playing in the NBA when they're designing their shoes, they're designed to be played indoor, outdoor, uh, deal with dirt, dust, all that stuff. And again, as you look at the technology, we have definitely better grip here, better grooves, a uh, break up in the grooves to actually create uh, different areas with better grip on there. So with this, we had a, a leather shoe, uh, we had the rubber toe box, we had the better grip, better uh, better support through here, so better cushioning for, for our, when we, uh, we land. But again, I can't imagine this as a basketball shoe. These are both casual shoes. To think that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar played his career in this shoe 20 years, six-time MVP, right? Most MVPs of all time, most points of all time, 19-time All-Star, so more All-Star uh, invitations than anybody, and he played his whole career in this shoe. This shoe dominated the 70s. Converse owned the NBA really right until the, the late 1960s. In the 70s, this shoe came out by the end of the 70s. 75% of NBA players were wearing the Adidas sneakers. Ah, but something happened. 1976, Converse comes back, and they come back with the pro leather, right? The pro star. This shoe needed somebody to make it cool again, and they got the coolest guy when the NBA merged. They got Dr. J to wear this shoe. So this shoe came along and changed the face of basketball again, and you had all these legends starting to wear this shoe again, including a couple of young rookies that would come in the league in 1979, 1980, that would change the game completely in Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. We'll talk about them in just a second. So what we're seeing right here is we're seeing history. The most popular shoe in the 50s and 60s, the most popular shoe of the 70s, the late 70s into the 80s. But now we're gonna talk about the decade that I love, the decade that changed basketball shoes for the better, 
it absolutely brought basketball shoes to the forefront and made them cool. You had the advertising, you know, the Be Like Mike, the Choose Your Weapon, all this cool stuff. And I know Be Like Mike is Gatorade, but we still kind of thought about that whole thing, right? The Mars Blackman commercials, all this cool stuff. So we're going to jump into the 80s and talk about how the technology changed in the 80s and what some of those shoes were. All right, so now we come to the 80s. And now the technology is changing like crazy. We had that Converse, that, that Pro Star, that Pro Leather, which was a great shoe. But then we got into this shoe, right? The Fast Break High. This is the No Easy Bucket. It's a No Easy Basket shoe that came out just a couple of years ago. It's a championship commemoration shoe for the Celtics championship win in 84 when Kevin McHale absolutely wiped out Kurt Rambis, right? But this shoe was, was groundbreaking at the time. And this is, you know, then we're going to talk about these iconic shoes. But these shoes were changing like crazy. We got into here again. We look at the shoes. We have the breakup of the sole of the shoe. Different shapes to give us better grip, right? To deal with moisture, dust, dirt, everything we were dealing with. You take a look at the shoe here. A much thicker sidewall here. So again, better absorption when we would land. We're actually building in stuff here into the heel cup to give us better ankle support. Uh, you know, a different types of material. We have nylon and leather, right? Just amazing cushioning here. So this is that next iteration. But then we came to these two shoes. And in my opinion, the two most important shoes in the history of basketball are right here in front of us because these shoes changed the game. You have the Converse weapon, right? Larry versus Magic. You have the Jordan 1s. This shoe made me want to actually go out and get a job when I was younger to buy a really cool basketball shoe. Uh, I grew up in an amazing home with, an, with amazing parents that loved me and cared about me, but we didn't have a ton of money. Like we didn't have money to spend $60 on a basketball shoe, just wasn't in the budget. So I started working at a really young age to actually save up money to buy my first pair of basketball shoes. And the first pair of basketball shoes I ever bought were these shoes right here, the black and white Converse weapons. Now I was fortunate that I had an amazing aunt uh, who was in the military and she bought me these for my birthday one year in this color. So I was blown away that I got to have the Jordan 1s and the Converse because I couldn't have imagined to be able to afford both. But this shoe was incredible, the Converse weapon, right? The game changer. This shoe came out and it was Larry versus Magic. As a matter of fact, let me grab my Magic shoe right here, right? This was it. This was the commercial. You, you'd see, you know, Converse talked about Magic had the commercial and he said to Berg, I heard Converse made a shoe for last year's MVP and then it was it was the shoe for this year's MVP. Now Magic actually wouldn't win the MVP that year, Larry won it three years in a row, but then you had the iconic commercial with everybody rapping with Kevin McHale, Isaiah Thomas, Mark Aguirre, Bernard King, Magic and Larry, right? Larry with maybe the worst rapping of all time, but this was iconic. These shoes were incredible. Now I had these, I was blown away and I wanted a pair. I never owned the Magic shoe when I was a kid. I did have the Isaiah blue and white, but I, you know, I just couldn't believe that this was the coolest shoe out there and I wanted it. And what happened with this shoe, again, completely different. That Y-bar technology. You get into here and you can actually see now, even from this generation, just one generation before, we're changing the bottom of the shoe completely, right? Now we have the circle here for pushing off on, the, on your forefoot for when you were jumping, right? You had this little collar right here which again was designed to be a different shape and give us better support. Even with this little indentation, you would get a little better grip. It would almost create a little bit of suction for you. And you take a look at the Jordan 1s and you'd actually see very similar technology on the Jordan 1 on the bottom. The biggest difference is Nike obviously brought the air technology into their shoes. This is the Jordan 1 Royal. Uh, you know, this was the original retro shoe that came out over 20 years ago. Both of these shoes are over 20 years old as, as of my Magic shoes. Uh, but as part of the collection, I absolutely love them. With this shoe, you had the air technology, right? You had, again, the great ankle support. You had the different technology in the bottom like we already talked about. The iconic design. And in my favorite, the jump wings, which would stay in the Jordans until Jordan 3 when you went to the jump man. Now, I know this isn't popular, but I absolutely love, love the wings as opposed to the jump man. I, I wish it stayed that way. I think the style is incredibly cool. But this shoe changed the game in another way. Jordan had the red and black shoes for Chicago. And back then in the NBA, you had to have white in your basketball sneaker. If you didn't, the NBA wouldn't let you wear it. So Jordan had this crazy commercial. We had the band sneakers. And everyone thought it was because Nike had come up with some crazy air technology, something that gave Jordan an edge over everybody else. It had nothing to do with it. He didn't have the white in the shoe. So you actually had 
the red, white, and black Jordans that came out, and those are completely legal and fine. But Jordan had this really cool, iconic commercial with two black boxes over the sneakers, and it said "Band" across the front of it. It was awesome. These were a game changer. Now, the Jordan 1s have changed the game completely, and I'm gonna show you some of mine in just a second, uh, because the Jordan 1s truly are now one of the most iconic shoes, and not from a basketball standpoint, but from a fashion standpoint. So let me show you some of the Jordan 1s over here. All right, so now we've come into the uh, kind of the fashion style, right? The Jordan 1 is iconic. We talked about, you know, all the different ads they had out there, the band shoes, all the stuff, but Jordans have become a, you know, the Jordan 1 specifically has become a life of its own with thousands of different colorways over the years, and maybe not thousands, but at least hundreds. Uh, and I love the shoe. I think it's super iconic, but there's a couple of different versions of it. I will share with you, this was kind of the first one that I really liked uh, more recently when I got back into collecting shoes after not collecting for a while and this was uh, this came out in I want to say 2007 2008 and this was the Jordan 1 low and I love this shoe a couple really cool things you had the, the clear bottom on the insole again nothing changed from a technology standpoint you had the, the red white and blue with the blue snake skin uh, the Jumpman logo here but you also had the iconic wings on the back uh, just a really cool shoe that had a really cool style. But then you actually look at a couple other different versions of the Jordans and you'll see here, we have two different versions. We have the pine green high and this is a premium Jordan one. And then we have the fat mid. Now this is the 2012 Olympic mid, um, right? So this was the 20th anniversary of the dream team. Uh, this shoe's pretty cool. I, I love the style on. I haven't been able to get myself to wear it because I don't want to get it dirty, but I love the colorway. Uh, the red, white, and blue, with the red wings, we have the gold laces, just a really cool looking shoe. Again, the same bottom. But you'll see here, this is the pine green that came out earlier this year. Uh, this shoe right here is a premium Jordan, so the difference is these would probably cost you about $125. These would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $190 to $200. But as you take a look at the two shoes, as you kind of evolve through here, uh, much better leather on this shoe. Uh, much better quality so really really cool but the Jordan 1 became this really cool iconic fashion brand and you have so many different options to kind of add the different shoes in there uh, that I was blown away but we started to think about technology in basketball shoes we want to talk about Jordan in general so in a second I'm going to share with you some of the Jordans I own currently and talk about how the technology has evolved through the years uh, with some of the different Jordan shoes now I will tell you this, full disclosure, I am way more of a Jordan fan in the early shoes, so the ones through fives. I do like the sixes as well. Uh, so I'm gonna share with you, I don't own any threes currently. I'm probably gonna get a pair soon, but right now today I don't have any. But I'm gonna show you uh, the Jordan fours, uh, the Jordan fives, the twos, and then the 16s. I have an original pair of 16s from about 20 years ago when they first came out with the spats on them. And we'll talk about how that technology has evolved with the Jordan technology. And then we'll get to some of the other brands before some of the newer technology right, today. So here we have the Jordan 1 uh, that I didn't talk to you about that I'm going to talk about in just a second. This is a hybrid Jordan 1 that came out more recently. Uh, that's a shoe I actually really like to play ball in. It's the newest basketball shoe I own. I bought it in 2018. Uh, and I really do like the technology. They did some pretty cool stuff. But we do want to talk about the Jordan 2s and the 4s. Like I said, unfortunately, I don't own any 3s right now. But I do want to talk about where that technology has evolved, right? So you went to the Jordan 2, and this shoe still had the iconic wings here before we went to the Jumpman, which we'll talk about in just a second. But this shoe was a huge step up from the Jordan 1. If you take a look at the bottom, uh, again, totally different technology. Um, again, designed for better grip. You took a look here, you had a really nice heel cup, good toe box. It was pretty wide through the forefoot, uh, so it would give us really good stability when you play, so great for pushing off. But this was the first $100 basketball shoe. I remember being in high school, uh, reading an article in either Sports Magazine or Sports Illustrated, and it talked about the first $100 basketball shoe. The Jordan 1s and the Converse weapons are right around $60 or $75, depending on when you got them. Uh, this was the first one that was 100 and I was blown away by the style on this. When this came out, it was so cool. The snakeskin style, uh, that really cool, iconic look, just really simple. Had the amazing poster with Jordan Duncan in the in the jogging suit that just looks so badass. So you, you saw this shoe and you were like, this is what you wanted to get to and you aspired to. Then the Jordan 3 came out and it was awesome. It was next level, right? But then you went to the Jordan 4. Now this was probably one of my favorite shoes to play basketball in when I was younger but it had a huge flaw. Uh, and most people will talk about it. iconic design, Jumpman, right? So the second iteration of the Jumpman, again, the first visible air bubble. You had on the three as well, I'm sorry. The three had the visible air bubble, so did the four. Again, the different bottom on the shoe. Uh, not so far removed from what the two was, a little different, right? You had a, a different design, 
uh, but did a really nice job with grip. Uh, this was a great mid shoe, so if you played ball in a mid-level shoe, which we didn't do a ton back then, I like this a lot. This is kind of when I had transitioned from playing a lot of um, forward to more guard. Uh, the reality is I'm 5'11". I thought I'd be tall, but I've been 5'11 since I was 13, so I learned how to play in the post and uh, I stopped growing, right? So as I transitioned into my junior year of high school, which was this shoe, uh, I went into, you know, playing more, you know, more um, from the wing, you know, became more of a, a slash and drive type player, more of an outside shooter than I was previously. So this was an awesome shoe. But the shoe to me, as cool as it is, had one flaw, and that was this eyelet system here. And if you wore this shoe to play basketball, you know what I'm talking about. These would break over time as you would go to tighten your laces. So as cool as the shoe was, and it's one of my favorites, it was not my favorite Jordan shoe. But I did want to get back to this shoe for just a second because I wanted to talk about this really cool hybrid technology shoe that came out. So this is a Jordan 1, uh, very similar style you'll see. We kind of have the cement design you'd find in the Jordan 3s later on. You have the strap across the front, which you'd find in some of the cross trainers, some of the Barkley shoes later. Uh, but this one has the air technology, the visible air bubble, um, but we have basically the same bottom as the 2. So if we take a look here, it is the same bottom as a Jordan 2, but it's kind of went on the Jordan 1. So you kind of a great cross of technology. I like this shoe a lot today and it was about $100 and it's a great shoe to play ball in. There are always different versions of this coming out. But let's talk about the 5 and the 16 in a second before we move on to some other great right. players. I'm going to start with the 16 and go backwards to the 5. And I know that seems backwards because this is like a 2000, 2001 technology. This shoe was a really interesting basketball shoe. I don't think it's particularly attractive, but at the time I was working in a shoe store. We had a friends and family deal. We had a pair sitting in the back. Uh, these hadn't sold incredibly well, so I got them like 50% off. So I think I paid $20 for these shoes. And I will absolutely tell you, while it's not the best looking basketball shoe, it was a really good basketball shoe to play ball in. It was actually, I played a lot of basketball in this particular shoe. Uh, I loved the, the support on the bottom. I liked how it narrowed in the middle. So you now had wider support uh, in your heel and that really wide forefront support. Great grip, great traction, that full length air along the bottom of the shoes. This was a really cool shoe that I liked a lot. Uh, to play ball in. Aesthetically, I wasn't blown away. You know, Jordan's whole thought process was to have the spats, which you'll see here, which go around the shoe, and it would try to give you kind of that tuxedo design that you'd wear on a, on a, on a pair of tuxedo shoes. Again, not sure how great of a job it did. I wasn't blown away by the style, but I would tell you as a basketball shoe, it was really good. But I wanted to save the five for last because I think the five deserves a complete different conversation. This is probably after the Converse weapon, this is probably my second favorite basketball shoe of all time. Uh, both from a style standpoint and from playing basketball. And this was a great shoe. I played a ton of basketball in this shoe. Uh, tr truth be told, the original colorway I had was the black and silver. I loved it. Um, you know, I like this colorway. It's called the International. It's more of a, almost a Knicks colorway, but I do like the, the blue and the orange. I think it's a really sharp shoe. But this shoe, when it came out, we already talked about some of the technology from the Air. We know what Air was doing. They did a really great job on this with the heel cup to give us really good stability when you played. Uh, really nice toe box, really nice width across the shoe. But just let's talk about the style on this shoe. The see-through sole, the 3M tongue. Um, this shoe was just so cool. And then this shoe was that first shoe that came out with the piece for your laces, right? So to actually support your laces, you'd have to tie them. You could actually tie them down with this piece that went in there. This was probably the most game-breaking shoe from a style standpoint that Jordan had until that point. And now, I know there's a ton of Jordan fans out there, the people that love the 9, the 11. There's a ton of iconic Jordan shoes. But to me, this was the pinnacle of what Jordan had done from a style standpoint. Technology would continue to evolve. You'd have some great shoes. But this is kind of where it was at. But I'm also going to talk about a couple other shoes and a couple of brands that people don't think about as much uh, that had some amazing people that endorsed those shoes that you might not realize. So let's talk about getting into the 90s and 2000s with some of the shoe technology. All right, so I'm going to take you into the 90s and the 2000s with the oldest shoe that I own. So this is the, this is the Converse. Uh, basically, this was Converse's basketball shoe in the 90s. It was a shoe right after the weapons before Converse went to cons. I did like the con shoe. They made a really cool Larry Bird shoe that I wore in high school my senior year as well as wearing my Jordans. Uh, and I was a fan. But this shoe right here, when it came out, I was pretty excited about it. What it did was a great, great ankle support. 
Again, you see the brace in here to kind of give us that better heel cup. Really nice wide base, good traction. But I was, it was for me, it was the coolest part was you had the Celtics branding, right? So the NBA and Converse was still really deep into a big partnership, uh, late '80s, early '90s. And you had this shoe come out, Celtics logo, Celtics name along the back. So this shoe is kind of near and dear to me, and it's the last shoe I have from you know back in that day that I haven't thrown away. The other shoes I have now are retro. Some of them are 20 years old, but they're the retro versions. Um, but this was cool technology, great basketball shoe, really heavy though, and, and the shoes have evolved a lot. So you start to get into, fast forward to the 2000s, uh, and you start to get into some of the newer technology, right? You had Dwayne Wade, which most people forgot that he started out wearing a Converse shoe. I loved this shoe, and I used to play a ton of basketball in it. I'm gonna be honest with you, it's pretty beat up. I haven't worn it in a long time. Not sure why I held on to it. There's some other ones I've gotten rid of, like I really liked my Latrell Sprewell and one shoe. A shoe company that was really cool from a style standpoint. Uh, I didn't hold on to that one. I don't, I'm not sure why I held on to this one, but I always have. I think it's maybe because I'm a Converse guy. But this was pretty innovative, right? This was really like one piece, the whole shoe. Uh, very seamless, that two-tone design. And this time in Converse, they were doing similar to Nike, so they were doing some different reactive materials in here that would give us really good cushioning. But the shoe was just really seamless. It really blended well together and it looked really cool. Now this time a lot of shoes kind of had these weird designs. You had the Kobe Adidas shoe, which I had, which was a really a strange shoe. Uh, the Reebok, it was not the, it was the Armadillo, which was a really strange shoe that you couldn't see anything. It was almost waterproof. I never wore it for basketball, but it actually became a great uh, shoe for shoveling snow. Uh, and you had the Reebok pump in the 90s. The black top pump was an amazing shoe. So all this really cool technology. And then you kind of came to Reebok here for the Iversons. Now this is the answer playoff low. Uh, there's the answer low and then there's the playoff low. I love the playoff version of this shoe. You know, Reebok used again, their different technology. When you went to the question, which was the first Iverson, like, you know, custom shoe, they used the Hexalite technology. So it was kind of the evolution from what they did with the pumps. They had the Hexalite. It looked really cool. That was kind of that honeycomb design you would see. But then it came into the answer, and then the answer playoff. And this was one of my favorite shoes. I'm actually looking to try to get a pair of these again. This is probably the only low top shoe I've ever played in that I felt comfortable playing basketball again. They did a great job back here in the heel of giving us enough lift in the back of the heel to feel really comfortable to play basketball in. Uh, amazing support, really good um, you know, cushioning when you would land. Again, the balance across super wide, uh, you know, base of the shoe at the, at the bottom for your heel, super wide in the forefoot, a little narrow here. This was a great shoe to push off on, uh, really good stability to rebound with. So as I get a little older, this was an awesome shoe to play with. So I was a huge fan of this shoe. I loved it. I think Iverson always did a nice job with his shoes. And again, Iverson was iconic, almost as much as Jordan when it came to the shoes. You know, you think about the LeBron shoes and the Kobe shoes, and there were some really cool ones along the way. You think about some of the stuff that Steph Curry and KD have done. Um, you know, you've had a bunch of different folks that have had some cool shoes. But I will tell you, again, in my mind, you kind of went from the Chucks to, to the Shell Toes with Kareem. And then you went to Dr. J with the Pro Leather and Bird and Magic were all wearing them. And then you had the weapons when you had everybody that was big at the time other than Jordan wearing it. And then obviously the iconic Jordan shoes. And then to me, again, they were the last iconic shoe uh, would be the Iverson shoes. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's been cool since, but there hasn't really been a LeBron uh, or even a Kobe that I think has kind of captured the imagination like Iverson did. So that's kind of the history of the shoe. What I want to do now is I want to show you a couple of my newer shoes. So I'll go back to that newer retro shoe and I'll show you a shoe I, a shoe I bought a few years ago from Nike, just a basic Nike Air basketball shoe. And we'll talk about what you want to look for in a basketball shoe today. So hold on just right. a second. So we have our, our Nike basketball shoe here. I bought this shoe a few years back and this was a pretty cool shoe. It was an air shoe. Uh, I just needed a basketball shoe to play in a league uh, probably about 10 years ago and I decided to sort of grab this shoe. And for me, when I was looking at a basketball shoe, there were a couple things that came to mind. One was, do I buy a shoe that is more comfortable, uh, like a lower cut shoe like we talked about with the Iversons, um, you know, at the time I was in my mid thirties, I needed a little bit more ankle support, a little bit more stability. You can see with this shoe, we have a ton of ankle support. You know, we have the Velcro piece across the top, the wide tongue, lots of ankle support, really wide forefront of the shoe, great grip, lots of cushioning here. So this was a really good basketball shoe for me. Uh, and I liked it a lot. 
Now, recently I went to buy a new pair of basketball shoes and I ended up walking away with these. I told you about two years ago. I don't get to play as much as I used to. I think if you've seen the channel, you know I've lost a lot of weight. COVID's kind of derailed me from playing in a league this year. My goal is to play in a league next year, at least to play more frequently next year to get back into playing ball some more. But the reason I bought this shoe versus any of the newer shoes, like the newer LeBrons or, or even the Steph Currys or, you know, the KDs, um, I like a leather shoe. Most of the newer shoes are synthetic. They'll use a nylon, you know, they'll use, a, 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 you know, spandex. There's a ton of different materials that they use to create the shoes today. Um, I still prefer a leather upper for a basketball shoe. For, in my opinion, it just still creates a more comfortable shoe. Um, and I feel safer and I feel like there's more stability and support. Now, technology has changed and I'm probably just being old school and, and I'm wrong. But I would tell you again, for me, this shoe made sense. And it is a good basketball shoe. Again, we forget that one of the greatest players of all time and Michael Jordan wore this shoe or a version of this shoe to play basketball at the NBA at the highest level, you know, while he scored 30 to 35 points a game. And now we treat it as a casual shoe that people wouldn't wear as a basketball shoe, which in my opinion is absolutely crazy. It's a great basketball shoe. So when you think about a basketball shoe, I do want to give you three things to think about. This is Fitness Technology Friday, not just a history lesson today. And we do want to give you some stuff to think about. With this shoe, when you think about a basketball shoe, I'm going to give you three recommendations. One is I'm going to recommend finding a shoe that meets the size you're looking for. And that means do you want a low cut, a mid cut, or a high cut shoe? When I grew up playing basketball, everyone wore a high cut shoe. We thought it was the only way you could prevent from, you know, spraining your ankle. So that was kind of where the shoe started. So we went to a high cut. I would tell you there's some really good mid and low cut shoes today. So find one that feels most comfortable for you. Two is find a shoe that suits the style of play that you have. If you're a light athletic guard, you probably don't want to bear a big heavy shoe. It's going to slow you down a little bit. It's also going to stop you from cutting as effectively. So you might want to wear a lighter, lower shoe, right? So you want to find a shoe that kind of meets that. So maybe you do want to wear a nylon shoe or something that's a synthetic material that's not going to weigh as much. It's going to give you good support, but give you better flexibility. Uh, if you're a big guy like I am and you want to play center or you're going to play power forward, uh, you know, like I did when I was younger, and I end up always somehow still getting stuck playing center or power forward when I play in these leagues, you probably want a shoe with a wider base, something that's going to be better for rebounding, right? So that's going to help you a lot. The last thing is you want to find a shoe um, that kind of meets your style, right? Look, again, I said I'm almost 50 years old. I can't pull off some of these shoes that are out there today. I just can't. They're too crazy looking. Uh, you know, they're not my style. You know, I'm not going to wear a purple LeBron Lakers shoe as a Celtics fan, although I did wear a Magic Converse shoe and I wear it pretty hardcore and beat it up pretty good. But today I'm not going to wear that shoe. So the three things you want to think about, what kind of shoe do you want, um, right? You know, mid, lower, upper. How, what type of player are, player are you? So help dictate the materials of the shoe you're gonna find and find one that you like aesthetically. I think if you do those three things, you'll find a great basketball shoe. You'll be comfortable, you'll like wearing it, you'll play more and that's important. So be back with you in just a second to wrap right, up. So we're gonna wrap up here. Um, first, let me just say thank you for checking out the video. This one has been a passion project for me. I love basketball. Uh, you know, I told you I'd show you a little bit of my office. You can see right here. You know, we've got our Bill Walton signed basketball, our Larry Bird ball, our bobbleheads up here, our Michael Jordan uh, ball, Paul Pierce signed right here. One of my favorite things of all time, that's me and Larry uh, from a contest I won from Mountain Dew when he was coaching the Pacers, which is one of my coolest memories ever. Uh, so this is a really cool thing for me to be able to share with you. Um, so thank you for, for kind of checking this out and watching this. As we progress through the history of the basketball shoe, Again, I'm just blown away where, where, where fitness technology has taken us over the years. From the humble Chuck Taylor in the 1920s to the 1960s where legends wore this shoe and played in a game that was very different uh, and were able to play for 14 or 15 years to, you know, again, one of the unsung heroes of the game, in my opinion, one of the GOATs, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar playing 20 years in a shell toe, which we couldn't even imagine now, to a cool, amazing shoe like Dr. J would wear with the pro leather to Larry and Magic and Isaiah and all those guys jump into the weapon, to the most iconic shoe brand of all time, the Jordan brand, where you had amazing shoes from the one to the five, uh, all the new stuff that's come in between, and then where we've evolved today to really cool technology that's going to get us to play better and, and, you know, and feel better as we're playing. The basketball shoe has come a long, long way in the last you know, 50, 60, 70 years. Uh, and I was excited to be able to share it with you. So like we say on Mayhem Fitness, let me know what you think in the comment section. If this is a video you like, I'd love to do versions of this for other things. Maybe, you know, some gym equipment or some of the different ways we track fitness. 
I'd love to maybe share the history of some of that with you. If you'd rather I just stay with the more traditional format and we review maybe one piece of technology for four or five minutes, that's okay too. I just appreciate you checking out the channel uh, and giving me the opportunity to share my sneaker collection in the history of the basketball shoe with you. So like we always say on Mayhem Fitness, please hit that like button, that subscribe button, hit that notification bell. We appreciate the opportunity to share this with you. You have an amazing day and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much.